uh, patients and why is it important? Why is it important as in like what is the value or relevance to uh, broader goods? And why is it also very hard or a complex, challenging problem to address from a data science and an AI perspective? Okay. And then uh, I'll walk through a series of what we call experiments that we did in our lab. And what I would say is more what are our learnings from these experiments? I don't want to proclaim success and that we have solved uh, all the world's problems, but at least some of the learning that we'd like to share back with this uh, practitioner community and of course, hopefully intrigue you a bit. If you're interested in learning more, I uh, would love to catch up. If you have some ideas that you would like to share with me during the course session or outside of, would love to hear that. But in something there's more a learning sharing and then uh, an exchange with this group, okay? And then uh, in addition to things that we have already done and some learnings, also some other uh, pieces that we are focusing on, kind of the, what is the path forward, so to speak, uh, in this area, okay? So uh, I'll try to keep, I don't know if we'll succeed, but I'll try to uh, keep it a bit interactive. <laughs> so uh, just have a few, there's an area in, uh, of disease categories called rare diseases. Have, has anybody heard about rare diseases? Okay, one, two people, not too many. <laughs> so uh, I'll just do a little 101, okay? And uh, hopefully this will motivate why it is an important uh, thing to focus on. I have a few fill in the blanks. Rare diseases occur in less than dash number of people out of 10,000 people. Sorry? One, okay. Point one. <laughs> I mean, it's actually not as rare as that, but it's five in 10,000 people. That's roughly the yardstick. But this, again, this yardstick varies from country to country. In the US, it, is, uh, it should affect 200,000 people out of, uh, not more than 200,000 people. In Europe, they say five in. 10,000 in Japan, they have a different standard. In India, we don't have a yardstick. <laughs> uh, so there is some variance there. And then uh, as the name suggests, these are rare conditions. So not a lot of the healthcare professionals would have actually encountered people with these conditions, like doctors or in hospitals and so on. So it does take a reasonable amount of time for people to realize and recognize that this person is suffering from a rare condition. So on average, how long do you think it takes to diagnose? Sorry, 10 years, I heard two to three years. Okay, you can take an average. So it's, uh, uh, some of the studies say it takes anywhere from 5.6 to 7.6 years. That's the range of time. So these people are suffering from a condition which, uh, and they're living with it without being diagnosed, not even getting to treatment. So they don't even know what they're suffering from, right? So fairly long time scale. Uh, any guesses on, while each uh, condition is rare, how many total number of rare diseases are there? More than a thousand, okay. I like the bounding, okay. There are actually uh, about 7,000 to 8,000 rare conditions, okay. And very often the, about 70% of those have actually have a genetic uh, kind of basis and 70% uh, occurs amongst children, okay? So these are fairly, well each condition is rare, right? Uh, given the total number of rare diseases, if we can actually tackle this problem of helping diagnose, identify, and treat rare conditions, we can affect a fairly sizable chunk of the world's population. So that brings me to the last one. So across the world, given the numbers I cited, what percent of people in the world suffer from rare conditions? No, across the world, across all rare conditions. 70%, rather. <laughs> uh, so it's around 7 to 8%. So if you, very roughly, 1 in 12 people, right? And I don't want to scare you guys, but in this room, if there are, let's say, <laughs> 60 people, so there would probably uh, 5 people who have some rare. Right? So, it, so it, it does, even though each condition is rare, it does affect a fairly sizable segment of the world's population. So kind of addressing this issue of helping diagnose and treat uh, rare patients to these patients is a important problem. But as you can imagine, so what are some of the, sorry, let, let me just uh, set a bit of a context and then we can get into the analytical uh, elements of the data science elements of this. So broadly, uh, we can think about a patient's journey 
By the way, it's kind of an interesting paradox. Right? Like people, when you say patient, when, when you're a customer in some fashion goods or beauty or so on, like people are willingly going there and <laughs> uh, engaging with this. But in this case, patients don't want to be patients. Right? We want to be healthy. <laughs> right? We want to be people who are healthy. Right? So in that sense, uh, the ideal state is not even uh, falling ill or falling sick and preventing the uh, condition from occurring. But I think the state of healthcare at this point is still several steps away from that utopia. Uh, but what we can aim to do is more uh, help, predict uh, who is suffering from a condition earlier, who is at risk of that, and then diagnose them early, minimize the number of complications that they're going through, get them on the right treatment sooner, right? get them connected with the right healthcare professional sooner. Right? Like that's, at this point, while the utopia is to predict and prevent, right, at this point, uh, we are trying to do predict an early intervention, early diagnosis, early treatment. That's kind of what we are uh, working towards. And so if you can think about kind of a journey of a patient, there's kind of the origination of the disease or the condition, right? And then there's the actual diagnosis. So you have the condition, but you don't know yet what condition you have. So there's an element of diagnosis. And then there's a slew of potential treatment options that are available to you, right? Like, so but what is the right treatment for you given your uh, on the treatment, they're compliant, they're persistent with it, and they really realize the benefits of the treatment. So this is kind of a very macro flow of how patients uh, journey all under two buckets. Like there's a series of prediction problems that we can solve, and there is a series of things in terms of based on the predictive insights, what are the actions that we can uh, actually take? Right? And again, I'm uh, predictions. Uh, like can I predict the patient is at risk of a rare disease? Right? And if they have now been diagnosed, what is the right uh, treatment to initiate them? So what predicting what is the right treatment for a patient? And if, so, if it's not uh, effectively working for them, can we uh, predict who are the non-responders to treatment and then help them progress to the right uh, uh, forward-looking treatments or what we call lines of therapy? And then there's also risk of uh, patients. I don't like to take my medication. I'm sure many of you uh, uh, in, the, in a similar bucket, right? Like so, and pe people start feeling a little better, they tend to discontinue treatment. So how do you predict the risk of uh, discontinuation and health design issues? Can you, excuse me? Can you just press escape if you don't know? I don't know if I can do this from here. And uh, in terms of actions, what, uh, Again, this is a bit of a life science, pharma-centric perspective. I know there are a few pharma colleagues of mine in the room. So the life science companies are looking to bring novel molecules to treat these kind of rare conditions, right? Like, so they run what are called clinical trials. And if these rare disease patients are not uh, available in large pockets, how do you identify what are the locations where you should uh, run your clinical trials? Which investigators or uh, doctors should you engage to run these clinical trials. So there's a set of things that we can, we can help uh, pharma companies in the uh, clinical trial side. And then uh, when you have a treatment or a novel molecule, how do you raise the uh, awareness of both patients and doctors uh, about the uh, treatments available and choices available? So there's different things that you can do to engage with uh, key opinion leaders, run disease awareness campaigns, and also more and more there's a movement towards uh, can we embed what are called validated systems in electronic medical records. So this is like a computer in your doctor's office. As they are interacting with you, can you give uh, pop-up information that helps guide their uh, diagnosis and treatment choices. So this clinical decision support. And of course, I talked about the costs of these uh, treatments being quite high. So there is how do we alleviate it for uh, people who can't afford the uh, treatments and then also, uh, in addition to the molecules themselves, life science companies do try to provide a range of uh, what we call wrapper services, patient services to help uh, patients kind of uh, get the best experience, best outcome. So there is, you can recommend the right course of actions uh, with individual patients. Okay, so that at a very macro level is uh, what we are trying to address from a. Uh, industry patient perspective. But let me get into, I know this group is itching to know more about the techniques and the algorithm. So 
Anybody has worked with patient data? I know, Samira. <laughs> uh, okay, a few people have. So again, patient data, uh, just if you want to imagine it, it's, it's structured data, but it's, uh, some elements can be unstructured, but uh, large chunks of it are structured, but very high dimensional data. So you think about uh, transactions, right? Like when a patient interacts with a doctor, they get a uh, diagnosis that gets recorded as a uh, transaction. Or they go to a pharmacy and they are filling the prescription, that gets recorded as a transaction. You go to a hospital in an emergency, that gets recorded. So it's essentially high dimensional transactional uh, data uh, capturing the interactions between a individual patient and the different stakeholders in the healthcare ecosystem. But from a, uh, that's like the structure of the data, but what are the characteristics of the data? So it's sequential, right? It's, there is an order of events that's occurring, right? And, uh, but it's also heterogeneous uh, as part of this high dimension, right? Like, so I talked about diagnosis, interactions with the hospital stakeholders, you go to a pharmacy. So within each of these, there is uh, many different uh, categories of things that can occur for different patients, right? So it's extremely uh, heterogeneous and high dimension. And of course, the other key element is, there's not just, not only sequential, but there is a temporal or time dynamic. To it. So you might have had a hospitalization a year back, and then uh, there's something else that occurs with you, for you now. Right, so you need to be able to uh, handle this type of uh, patient level data. And again, um, there is one category what is called claims data. This is essentially mainly for financial purposes, but it does capture these healthcare transactions. But more and more there's emerging streams of data around uh, genomics. Right? And then when you go to a lab and get a test done, not only do you get the transaction that a test was done, but you get the results. So your MRI images or your CT scan, right? Like that type of data is emerging, but still that is only available to for even smaller sliver of uh, people at scale. So a lot of the experiments that we have done is more with the uh, things that are available at scale, what we call real world uh, claims or EMR data, okay? So uh, as I said, the core, I'll not talk so much about the action part, I'll talk a little bit more about the experiments we ran on the uh, prediction part. That itself is a fairly challenging problem to solve. So we all, for those who are, so I described rare disease, we are trying to identify patients with a rare condition earlier, right? They don't know it yet. So how do you guys go about solving it? What paradigms would you use? What methods might you, if you were to solve the problem, how do you go about it? Seems like a simple binary classification problem. You have rare disease patients once, then the rest of the people are Zeros, right? So run a binary classification. Maybe some people are nodding. Some people are still thinking. Okay. <laughs> Any other ideas? Sorry. Normally detection problem. Okay, interesting. That's a good framing. Sorry, I can't uh, use a given the temporal nature. Maybe use like a RNN-based deep learning paradigm. Good. All right. Sorry. A priori algorithm, okay. Oh, interesting, good. So these are all valid ideas. I don't think we have tried the a priori, we have tried the RNN. And we do do things which are more unsupervised, which is in this clustering similarity based matching. So, but uh, there are a few nuances or challenges uh, beyond the characteristics of the data, right? The, I have just laid out a few of those. So we have what are called noisy labels, right? So there is, uh, people are suffering the, from the condition, but they're not yet diagnosed. So in the data, they'll show up as a zero, right? Uh, they're not yet showing up with the transaction, but they're already suffering from the condition. So how do you make sure you're uh, treating the fact that zeros are not always zeros in the data, right? So that's a very interesting, important thing. And I'll not get into all the detail, but uh, what we have tried in our lab is, what are called weekly supervised or semi-supervised methods. In fact, one of the paradigms that we have seen a lot of success with is something called positive unlabeled class learning, PU learning. Okay, so, and we use a combination of the more prevalent, popular XGBoost and the ensemble models in conjunction with uh, PU learning concepts. And that actually helps address this issue of noisy labels quite effectively. Then I talked about the high dimensionality, just to give you a few numbers, uh, there is a standard 
for classification of diseases, international classification of diseases, there are about 50,000 plus diagnosis codes, right? And there are about 70,000 plus procedure codes. And if you multiply that by the time and the patient, right, you're running into uh, very high dimensionality. And each, uh, and this related to it is the cardinality of the data. Okay, and so the classic machine learning pipeline process, you have to uh, kind of think about, we talked about the Y variable, which is the label, but what is the set of X's that you want to put into your model, right? So, and given this uh, large search space of potential X variables, there is some efforts that you have undertaken to help optimize the hierarchy of how we group these uh, codes, okay? And also some uh, interesting techniques. Of course, there is auto ML and auto feature engineering, but what we have done is something called intelligent feature engineering, okay? Feature discovery more so than. So it's less led by trying to uh, brute force navigate a search space, but can you navigate the search space in a bit more, you know, uh, smart, so applying principles of optimization and evolutionary algorithms to uh, feature discovery is something that we have done and we are seeing some reasonable success here. And of course, uh, needle in the haystack problem, right? Like rare conditions, so class imbalance is a very uh, interesting issue there. And so there we have used some typical techniques uh, around weighted cost, right? And then we have also tried something with uh, synthetic data augmentation or core sampling using generative models, okay? And the other interesting thing is even though I showed it as a kind of the sequential data temporal, right? Like let's say you have a hospitalization. Right on the data, it'll show up at this point in time, right? But there's in some sense like a carryover effect of this. So even though data is seen as discrete, the effects are actually happening over uh, time. So you need to almost model it like a, uh, each discrete event has to be modeled as a uh, continuous function. So it's kind of an interesting dynamic. So when you think about sequential data and text and so on, it's like truly discrete, but here there is a little bit of, uh, uh, continuous distribution function that you need to uh, engage with there. And so there we have tied out something called a uh, point process. So these are some of the challenges, nuances of solving this prediction problem and some of the uh, ideas, techniques that we have applied. And I'll share what are some learnings uh, from our, okay, I'm just gonna skip this. So again, I just wanna, so, I think people talked about different methods and techniques. So what we have used is a mix of learning paradigms, semi-supervised, supervised, unsupervised, right? And uh, again, within that, there are different methods and techniques that we have combined and uh, played around with. Um, and this is the data cardinality issue, right? The typical way that people uh, handle the large set of uh, codes and some that are available is they'll apply some rules uh, saying, these 50,000 codes, let's put it into these 300 uh, buckets and kind of uh, do, do it that way. But what we did was a bit different where uh, we navigated that hierarchy and said which part of the hierarchy should we uh, keep at the most granular level and which part should we, is it okay to lose some of the uh, grain? So using a mix of some statistical methods and uh, metrics, we were able to identify. So for this prediction problem, this is the level of the hierarchy for different codes that we should actually input into the uh, models. And then uh, these are the different classes of models that we played around with. So of course, started with a more classic uh, XGBoost uh, ensemble uh, model with uh, more, what I will say, hypothesis-based features. So there's both the features and the algorithm. So, uh, and we did see reasonably AUC, but the APRC was uh, not good. So the precision uh, was rather low. And so first we augmented the classical model with what we call intelligent or auto feature engineering. So it wasn't she searching that large uh, search space much more uh, intelligently. And that itself gave us a uh, pretty good boost in terms of the uh, accuracy measures, right? Like for the prediction measures. And then uh, we did uh, layer in, and here, uh, by the way, in both these, I talked about this PU learning, so that's something we 
uh, leverage in use. And then the deep learning transform based models, we did try the uh, RNNs and CNNs first, but then we landed with a custom architecture, which we call, uh, it's inspired by BERT, but we call it rare BERT. So that uh, gave us some really uh, interesting and powerful results. And then we also ran a separate experiment with these uh, Seahawks or point frosts. I explained it a little simplistically, but uh, it was to take care of the temporal nature of the data. And there again, so these, in some sense, the classing model by itself with hypothesis was not sufficient. These were kind of our uh, model contenders. And of course, there are trade-offs to be made uh, in terms of what we should use here. And so one thing we did, it was directionally insightful, but we have not yet uh, figured out uh, like how exactly to translate into explanation. But our question that we asked ourselves was, I guess the accuracies are uh, somewhat similar, but what is it that they are learning? What are these different paradigms learning? And so we kind of tried to discern uh, what is the feature space of the uh, predictors. And so the read this kind of our feature learning using XGBoost CU and intelligent feature discovery. Greens are bird based transform model features. And then the uh, blues are what we are discovering from Seahawks. So it's kind of interesting. It's not, they're not all learning the, uh, same thing. That's at least what we could infer directly. Now, if you ask me exactly what is it different about feature A versus feature B, we have not yet uh, been able to fully uh, solve it. But we are curious, like are they really learning different things? Is it relevant to use uh, these different paradigms? So when you, and by the way, I don't know if you guys have, anyone has cracked this problem of, uh, I largely see these uh, CSNE or UMAP plots to <laughs> look at features, but anyone has cracked the problem of uh, visualizing large embeddings and features would love to hear more about it. But it was kind of interesting. It is interesting, I don't know if it is useful yet, but at least says that there is some value in each of the different uh, paradigms here, okay? And the other thing that's uh, critical in this setup is data capture is always a problem, okay? So uh, just because some information is not recorded in the data doesn't mean that the person does not have that, right? Like either the, the system through which the data is being collected, the patient is going outside the system so you don't capture the information or uh, they're receiving insurance from a different firm. So there is a uh, loss in data capture, not necessarily the patient is not having that. So you need a ability to uh, build your models in a robust way so you can handle these uh, data capture issues. And what we have done is uh, essentially simulate uh, data loss, right? So we, uh, what we do is we do adversarial attacks on our models to see how they perform under these adversarial attacks. So it's in something simulating the uh, data issues or data gaps and seeing what, uh, how resilient are your models. Okay, and you can, uh, in the previous slide I showed the XGB model that was really poor, performed very poorly when you were, uh, had adversarial attacks, the model performance deteriorated and the LSTM based models also which is the, uh, the rare bird architecture that we have developed. Uh, again, we don't have an explanation for it, but empirically it is giving us better performance when uh, you try to test the robustness of the uh, model. So that's something we have uh, seen as well. So then this is another learning for us that not only is it about building the model, but also testing it under uh, different data capture conditions. I'll not get into, yeah. And, and each of these paradigms do have uh, certain benefits and trade-offs, right? Like so both the auto feature engineering and the uh, point process were more flexible to uh, new information. Uh, being able to really run it at uh, scale was more possible with the AFE. The explainability was good in auto feature engineering, but uh, the, uh, rather low in your deep learning kind of uh, transform models. And these two, as I just showed, the ability to handle noise or uh, data capture was high. Performance is reasonably similar, right? And point process do have the ability to look at kind of marry discrete and continuous process very effectively. So there is some benefit. We didn't, these two we did try, but the results are not as uh, encouraging. So we kind of move forward more with the 
plus the parallel. So this is a little bit about what we've been uh, doing to date in our lab on this uh, class of problems. There are a few other things that we are starting to, uh, or we are not starting, but we have, we have been doing for the last uh, six, 12 months. Uh, one is of course, continue to improve the model robustness and accuracy. So based on all the learnings, where can we take it next? What paradigms can we try? And I talked about prediction uh, problems, but then how do we complement it with the right set of algorithms, methods to act on those predictive inputs. So, uh, and there uh, we are trying some things in the area of, can we influence or drive uh, patient behavior? So it's a mix of what we call as understanding the unconscious biases of patients uh, that affect their behaviors and can we look to drive the uh, appropriate behaviors from patients. So that's, and that's a very interesting uh, uh, field of study that we are undertaking. And of course, I talked about these large scale claims and patient service type of data sets that are more readily available that we are mining, but there is a uh, emerging scale to uh, the unstructured data, so our multimodal data, right? Like, so how can we marry that, the images that we talked about, the unstructured nodes, right? It's still available, the main issue is the sample size, right? You can derive some interesting insights, but when you actually have to apply and act on it, it it's not yet there, but still, uh, we are playing around with some multimodal learning models uh, in our lab. And then uh, there is also some interesting experience, experiments we're doing with, uh, in fact, can we interact with PubMed data using GPT-3, right, so rather than getting into very technical uh, claims coding, right, can you express in natural language what kind of patients you're looking for and can you then translate that into some interesting things on the uh, structured data. And then the other big challenge yeah. at Z is we are looking to help improve the health outcomes for people across the globe, right? So of course there are some countries that are both rich and data rich. <laughs> so America, there is a lot of data, but uh, these problems of rare conditions are not uh, purely a rich or a poor country problem. So there is, how do we handle uh, situations where the data is not very uh, rich? And there again, it runs some things in the transformer learning paradigm. So can we build our models using uh, data in more data rich countries, but then can we uh, bring it back to uh, data poor countries in some interesting way? It's very, very hard problem. Easy to say, but <laughs> very hard to do. So that's something we are uh, playing around with. And I, I talked about the adversarial model attacks to test the robustness of the data, but the broader paradigm is how do we ensure fairness of the model? How do we increase the transparency and explainability of the model? Right, like these are some uh, key things that we are uh, trying to solve in our, yeah. okay. time is not moving. How much time is left? Oh, we do have a fair bit of time. But maybe I'll uh, stop here. I don't want to bore you guys too much. <laughs> but hopefully you guys got a little bit of uh, interesting insights. We can have a conversation. I, had, I do have a few slides on each of these, but I think I'm starting to see people's eyes glaze over a bit. So I'll pause here and <laughs> just invite questions, thoughts.